good evening. Uh, hello, Arlington, as they say in the rock and roll business. Is that? Uh, thanks for coming. I'll make this really short and sweet. Uh, I know you're all here to hear uh, from Bo everything that you didn't see on WKRP. And uh, as you can see from the cameras, we're taping this tonight uh, for Arlington TV. And it's real important when we get to the Q&A, if you have a question, please wait uh, to say your question into the microphone, because if you just say it and there's no microphone, then there's long moments of silence on the sound for the video. So uh, just wait for the microphone. And uh, without any further ado, Bo Phillips. Thank you. Thank you. It's midnight in the San Francisco International Airport, and I had had a brutal week of working in the Bay Area, and I just couldn't wait to spill myself onto the airplane and sleep all the way across the country. So I treated myself to a first-class ticket. I cashed in some miles. All that was available was a red-eye flight. So I board the flight at midnight. I throw my bag in the bin. I grab a pillow and a blanket, and I curl up against the window, just wanting to fall asleep when I hear some commotion at the front of the plane and I hear somebody near me say, there's a rock star getting on board. So I didn't think much of it until I felt someone settling into the seat next to me. And I kind of squint down and I see this hand with a skull ring on every finger on top of a cane with a silver skull at the top. And I kind of turned my eyes up to see who it was that was uh, sitting next to me. And I find myself nose to nose with Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones. In fairness, under the lights of the airplane's fluorescent lights at 12 midnight, Keith looked a little bit more like this. <laughs> <clears throat> but I looked at him, and he, he gave me this look like, don't even think about it. And I thought, OK, I'm exhausted. I'm just going to lay down and sleep anyway. So the plane takes off. All the lights go off on the plane, except Keith. This is Keith's time of night. Keith is a party animal. So while everybody else is sleeping, he has the flight attendant hopping and bringing drinks to him all the time. And after a few drinks, I hear this, I'm Keith. And I went, all right, nice to meet you. I wake up and nice to meet you. Um, and he started chatting. And he turned out to be just a wonderfully charming, engaged, articulate, although it's impossible to understand every other word that he says because his accent is, is so heavy. And, and the more drinks you put into them, less and the less I was getting out of the conversation. But he talked about his love for music and his passion for music and the fact that he would play for nothing and that Mick is just a greedy bastard. I would go out there and play with anybody on any day. Um, and we had a wonderful time chatting. And um, I learned a lot about him. Um, he's the least pretentious rock star you can possibly imagine. He does it for all the right reasons. By all rights, he should be dead several times over right now. And he even admits that in his autobiography, um, but really is one of the biggest in the land. So we're flying, and we're about a half an hour outside of JFK. And he says, Bo, do me a favor and walk off the plane with me. And I said, sure, we're pals, of course. <laughs> so um, the plane lands. Everybody gets off. Keith grabs his uh, fur coat and his cane, and we're last off the plane. And as we're walking down the terminal, I said, what's, what's going on? And he said, well, whenever I travel, somebody sees me get on a plane, and they put the word out to Stone's fans that Keith is on flight such and such headed for New York, and inevitably there's going to be people out there waiting for me that want an autograph. So he goes, I'm happy to do that, but just scoot me through the line. I said, sure, that's fine. So lo and behold, we're heading to the terminal, and here's about 15 people all holding guitars for him, and Sharpies for him to autograph. So Keith walks up to the first one, and he shakes hands, and how you doing? And he's signing, and he's taking the next guitar and signing. And we get down to the last person, and I look over his shoulder, and I see that he's signing the guitar, but he's not signing his name. He's signing my name. <laughs> so I kind of whisk him away and head him towards his driver. I said, what are you doing? And he says, those people don't care about me. They're not a fan of the Rolling Stones. They're people who want my autograph so that they can sell it on eBay. He goes, so I figure, screw them. I travel, and I find someone like you, and I ask them to come off the plane with me like I did with you, and whoever I happen to be standing with, that's the name I sign. <laughs> so somewhere out there, there's a handful of people that swear to their friends that Keith Richards actually signed their guitar, and for some reason, in indelible marker pen, it says Bo Phillips. 
So to those people, I say, you can't always get what you want. You get what you need. <laughs> but I, I became a fan of the wisdom of Keith Richards, um, because this is a man who still lives in, with, with the fountain of youth. He's still a guy that has all the passion and all the charisma and, and, and all the, uh, the enjoyment of life that you could possibly want. And he looks like hell. Um, but there's a magical spirit about Keith Richards that was really extraordinary. And um, he is truly someone that is forever young, at least on the inside. Keith turned 72 on Saturday. But I'd like to take you back to a time when air was clean and gas was cheap and Michael Jackson was black and Saturday Night Live was funny, a time when disco sucked and a time when rock was great. There was really a special window for whatever reason in time. It had never happened before and it has, will never happen again, unfortunately. But from the late 70s into the mid 90s, the biggest rock bands in the world put out the best albums of their career. And it was a fire hose of remarkable music, the British giants of the Led Zeppelins and the Pink Floyds and the Who's, uh, the, uh, the Heartland American stars of uh, John Mellencamp and Bob Seger and Bruce Springsteen and the corporate rock of what I call Journey O Sticks Wagon. Then you have you know, the Van Halens and the Eagles and the bands like Rush and Pat Benatar and Bon Jovi and Def Leppard and they were coming in absolute torrents. It was a fire hose of amazing music by amazing artists. I happened to be working at one of the more influential rock stations in the country, it was in Seattle. And I was one of about maybe 15 or 20 program directors of the radio station that really had a lot to say with what music got played and which bands broke. Because remember, this was a time before Pandora, before Sirius XM, before iPods and file sharing. This was a time that if you were a fan of music, you got it from the radio. And many of you grew up probably listening to some really extraordinary radio stations where you really felt a connection, that they, was, they were actually turning you on to really interesting music. But these bands came at a time where you could not get out of the way of the great music. At the same time, we had a phenomenon called record stores, where you could actually spend some time pawing through the bins and finding music that you might like. There were record labels that had money and supported their artists and put them out on the road where you could go see, and I'm sure many of you have stories of seeing great bands for five bucks at some point in your, you know, in, you know, in your life. Um, then there were the concert promoters who were all based locally, and we were kind of a band of people that brought music to town, but radio was the mouthpiece. Radio was the way that people heard about the shows, heard about the music, drove people to the record stores. But there was a very special coming together of all of these people at the same time uh, as the music was absolutely soaring. And that was a, a window that unfortunately never really will exist again. But during that time, because I ran a radio station that had some influence, bands knew that. And when they were touring and came through town, they made a point of coming to my radio station asking me to go backstage afterwards, go to their hotel room for a party, sometimes getting on a bus or a private plane with them. I was nobody special. I was a fly on the wall. I didn't have any delusions that pe these people liked me for me. They liked me because of what I could do. And when they invited me places, I was only too happy to say, sure, that sounds like a lot of fun. Um, lots of people have met a lot of the people that I've met. But for whatever reason, there was, when I was together with them, crazy shit happened. Um, and I'll start with this one. The Beatles stayed in a hotel in Seattle called the Edgewater Hotel in the 60s, mid-60s. And the Edgewater Hotel is built out over Seattle's Puget Sound on a pier. And they had a campaign where you could actually fish from your window. They had a, tackle and, a bait and tackle shop inside the lobby where you could rent a pole and get bait and fish from your window. And there's famous pictures of beetles actually fishing but not catching anything. Led Zeppelin caught a fish when they stayed there in 1969. And those of you who are nodding right now know that I'm not going to go down that road and tell the mud shark story. But if you want to Google Led Zeppelin and the mud shark, it was so heinous that it got Led Zeppelin kicked out of the hotel for life, and they shut in the bait and tackle shop. It was that bad. Um, a friend of mine was the manager of the Edgewater Hotel and told me that what people never found out is that several years later, Led Zeppelin checked back into the hotel in the dead of night. This is a time long before 
uh, online reservations. It was at a time when you could call yourself Joe Smith and get a reservation into the hotel. My friend, the manager, gets into the hotel, into the Edgewater, and he says, uh, he, he says, who are these kind of scraggly looking people running through the hallway? And he checks the register and finds out that, lo and behold, at three in the morning, Led Zeppelin has checked in. So he calls Zeppelin's manager, and he says, oh, welcome back to the Edgewater. If there's anything I can do, just let me know. Uh, obviously, what he was really saying is, I know you snuck back into the hotel, and my eye is on you. Led Zeppelin stayed at the Edgewater for two pretty uneventful days and nights. But when they were checking out, my friend, the manager, calls the head of housekeeping and said, how do their rooms look? She goes, oh, the rooms are great. You know, they didn't fish. There's no problem, except all of the TVs are gone. <laughs> so he says, stay there. And he runs down the hall, opens the first door, and lo and behold, the TV's gone, and the drapes are blowing. So he pulls back the drapes, looks out the window, and there's not one but five TVs bobbing in Puget Sound. So he goes back to the front desk, and here comes Richard Cole, Led Zeppelin's road manager, to check out. And um, my friend, the manager, goes, Mr. Cole, 10 rooms, the bill's $3,000. Richard Cole, the manager, reaches in his pocket, pulls out a huge roll of hundreds, and he peels off 30 and pays the hotel bill. So my friend is thinking that went pretty well. Uh, Mr. Cole, I also have to charge you for those TVs that you threw out. Mr. Cole chuckles and goes, how many did they toss? And he says, well, five, and at 500 bucks each, you owe me another 2,500 bucks. Reaches back in his pocket, pulls out a roll again, peels off 25. Who carries $5,500 bill? Pays the bill. As he's ready to leave, there's a desk clerk standing right there who's watching this whole thing go down. And he says, Mr. Cole, I'd always heard that Led Zeppelin had a reputation for trashing hotel rooms and throwing TVs, but I didn't really believe it. He goes, you got to tell me, what does it feel like to unplug the TV from the wall, lift it up, open the window, toss it into the water? Richard Cole looks at the kid, and he goes, kid, you know, there's some things in life you just have to experience for yourself. And he reaches in his pocket, <laughs> peels off five more $100 bills, and hands them to the desk clerk and says, kid, go toss a TV courtesy of Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and that was the crazy stuff that happened. That was really just the, uh, the mind-bending things that happened. And one of the things that I want to talk about tonight is for some extraordinary reason, this music is being handed down. And I see people my age, and I see people younger. And that's really my point, is that for the first time in history, this music is being handed down to the next generation. My mom and dad grew up with um, Sinatra and Elvis and Broadway show tunes. And I always thought that was fine, but it never became my music. This music is being embraced by younger people. And there's a couple of reasons for it. And I think it largely has to do with the fact that this was brilliant music. We're not just old farts who are saying we, were, we grew up in a special time. Uh, it was a special time. And the music was powerful, and the music had something to, to say. Uh, artists actually wrote their own music. They played their own instruments. They didn't have auto-tune. They didn't have you know, uh, computerized drums. They were real singers and real writers and real performers and real talent. So it's really been an extraordinary phenomenon. And my theory is that it started like a lot of things did with the Beatles. Because the Beatles not only affected everybody's fashion and hair, but they also started people uh, interested in playing guitar. And all of a sudden, music stores popped up. There really weren't music stores much before the Beatles. People, you know, kids started forming their own bands. I mean, it really gave rise to a tremendous amount. But more than anything, listening to a Beatle album was an experience. It was something you could share with your friends. You could look at the pictures. You could read the lyrics. It became something that was, um, was really remarkable. It was, it was an experience that created lifetime allegiances with, with bands like that. Uh, we also knew the band's names. We knew who the members were. We knew what instruments they played. Um, and speaking of instruments and, and artists and who, who played and, and People who are in famous bands, you may know, you may recognize this guy. If you had a high opinion of Paul McCartney before tonight, I'm about to take it even higher. I was running this rock station, but I also was on the board of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. 
And as you probably know, Make-A-Wish grants wishes to terminally ill children. And usually when there was something, a request for concert tickets or something, I would get a phone call saying, Bo, can you help? And I always try to. Um, but this call came in from a 19-year-old young woman named Kelly who was suffering from brain cancer. And Kelly's one wish was to meet Paul McCartney. I mean, couldn't you ask for somebody bigger, for God's sakes? <laughs> Um, so I reached out to Paul's management company and record label and said, we have an unusual request. Paul is going out on tour. Can he spare a few minutes to meet her? Uh, and the answer came back from everybody asked, we're really sorry. But this is Paul's first American tour since John Lennon's been killed. And he really doesn't want to expose himself at all. So he's going to play his shows. He's going to go back to the hotel. He's going to go to the airport and fly on. He's not doing any press. He's not meeting anybody. Please tell her that we respectfully just can't. So I went back and told Kelly and her mom that I tried. It's just not going to happen. Is there anything else I can do for you? And they went, no, that's really all she wanted. And it broke my heart. And I didn't mean to do it. But I played a card that I, I didn't want to play. And I called Paul's people back. And I said, you know, Paul has a 19-year-old daughter named Stella, who's a famous fashion designer now. And she's perfectly healthy. Can you imagine the horror of having a 19-year-old daughter that's not healthy, that has three months to live? and her only wish is to meet Paul McCartney. Can you please just shake her hand and, and, and spend a minute with her? And a couple of days later, they came back and said, OK, he will. But there's one condition, and the condition is nobody can know. Paul isn't doing this for credit. He doesn't want the press to know. He doesn't want anybody reporting on it. He's doing it because he's a dad and he cares. So we were back at the kingdom, and we were told to be at this special gate, Kelly and her mom and I. And we sat there until someone guided us back through the building. And we walk into the kingdom, which is 60,000 seats, and it's empty. It's just chairs, except for the band is warming up on stage. And we get walked way back into the bowels of the building into this green room. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, the curtain parts. And here's Paul, and he says, Kelly? And he comes walking towards her, and Kelly stands up to shake his hand, and he brushes by her arm and hugs her. And Linda hugs her. And Linda had brought a, a stuffed bear for Kelly that she gave to them. Now, I don't know if any of you have met famous celebrities or if you're sports stars or whatever. You have a chance to do a meet and greet. But usually, it's a hi, hello, nice to meet you. Let's take a picture. And then the next people come in. And I thought, if that's what we had to deal with, that's what we had to deal with. After all, it is Paul McCartney. But what Paul did is he sat down on one side of Kelly. And Linda sat down on the other. And they talked to her for half an hour. And they told her jokes, and they told her how pretty she looked, even though she had no hair and had bought a new beret and a new dress. And they made her laugh, and they talked about peace, and they looked her right in the eye, and she was just completely in awe. And I look over at, at Kelly's mom, who's watching this, and she's got tears running down her face, because she's seeing her daughter realize her greatest wish. Uh, Paul stayed for a half an hour, stood up, and then took pictures with everybody. And I expected him to say, thanks, have a good time, I'm going to leave now. So as everybody's shaking hands and saying goodbye, P Paul goes, oh, we're not done yet. And he leads us out into the kingdom and walks us over to these merchandise tables. And he said, are you about a medium? And he's grabbing stacks of shirts and stacks of sweatshirts and jackets and ball caps. I mean, she's you know, like buckling under the weight of all this stuff. He says, now follow me. And he sits us right here. This is in a stadium where the first three seats center. And he jumps up on stage and does what's called a sound check, a rehearsal, to make sure that the sound levels for all the instruments are correct. And he and the band played half a dozen songs. And whenever they played a song that had someone's name in it, I remember the song Get Back, where he says, Get Back JoJo, he replaced Kelly's name wherever he could. And he smiled, and he winked, and he was just wonderfully charming. And when he was done, he jumped off the stage, and he gave her a big hug. And he said, I've got to go get something to eat and get ready for the show. Are you gonna, am I going to see you at the show tonight? And she said, well, it was sold out. I didn't get a chance. We couldn't get tickets. And he said, let me take care of that. And he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out three laminated passes. He goes, we're going to put three chairs on the soundboard, which is right where the sound is the best, in the middle of the venue, and you're my guest tonight. And then away he went. And we stood there in the parking lot looking at each other afterwards like, did that really happen? Could somebody be that much of a hero in real life? It was really something to see. And that's a lot of what I got to see in my experiences. That's one of the few in my book that are not about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but about the humanity of, of some of these people that you meet that are just so remarkable when you meet them in person. But Paul couldn't have been more of a hero. And uh, this is a picture 
that was taken of Paul with Kelly. So, yeah, pretty special guy. Interestingly, the top 10 albums of all time probably won't surprise you. It's the Beatles. It's um, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, ACDC, Fleetwood Mac, and the number one record of all time, I don't know if you know this, is the Eagles' greatest hits. This is Joe Walsh of the Eagles. Um, Joe Walsh is the clown prince of music. When the, when the Eagles broke up in 1980, they took a hiatus. Joe, like Keith Richards, is very childlike, loves to play, will play anywhere. He joined a punk band in Australia for a while just because he wanted to play. But Joe is an absolute kick. Um, he's an, a sweetheart of a guy from Cleveland, Ohio, who no matter uh, whether he's feeling good or bad, has a smile on his face and will welcome you with a how you doing. That's Joe's whole signature line, how you doing. I had the idea one time uh, at my radio station, uh, I was, my, my, my afternoon show had gone on vacation for a week and I needed something for that week and I had the weird idea to put a celebrity in there and somebody said, you know, Joe Walsh wants to do radio. And I thought, well, that would be fun. So I called his manager and I said, look, I need someone to do the afternoon show. Would Joe be interested? And he goes, well, let me ask him. He goes, he goes how much can you pay? And I said, well, I'll pay him $10,000. And, uh, and he'll come in and do the whole show. And then on the last day, he'll do a concert for our, our listeners. And he goes, okay, let me talk to Joe. Joe's all for it. So Joe comes to town, and uh, I call a friend of mine who's at the Sheraton. And I said, I need a couple of hotel rooms for some people that we're bringing in. And the names are Joe Walsh and his manager. And she goes, is this the Joe Walsh? And I said, yeah. And she goes, wow. She goes, I'd love him to stay here. I'll comp him rooms, and I will I'll upgrade them to suites. We'd love him to stay here. I said, that'd be perfect. So Joe Walsh and his manager come to town, and I introduce him around the radio station and take him over to the Sheraton to get checked into these beautiful suites. And Joe, uh, I'll spare you the details, but Joe is a lot of fun. And in the book, I talk about the, the types of crazy things that he was doing as a, as a disc jockey on the air, playing in, 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 including in, insisting for the artist that he doesn't like to play them the, the song the same time as another artist so it goes by faster. Um, <laughs> So at the end of the, uh, the week that Joe was there, he plays a wonderful concert for, uh, for the radio station. And then a few days later, I get a call from the Sheraton saying, well, what are we going to do about Joe's bill? And I said, what do you mean Joe's bill? I thought you said it was free. And they said, well, no, the room's free, but he has incidental charges. And I said, all right, what are we looking at? She goes, well, $10,000. I said, $10,000? She goes, he, uh, he ordered in about $1,500 in booze. This is one guy there for five nights. I said, all right, what about the other 8,500? Where's that going? She goes, well, Joe took everything that could be shredded in the room and shredded it. <laughs> the pillowcases, the blankets, the draperies, the shower curtain, anything that could be cut in strips was cut in strips. And Joe left it in a giant mound. In the it was kind of like his leaving his mark, you know. Um, but Joe, you may know, is also famous for traveling with a, a chainsaw in a guitar case. And if he didn't like the room he was in, he would just cut it open a hole in the wall and create an adjoining suite. So I think I got off lucky with just having to replace some, some stuff. But I called his manager and I said, you can't stick me with a $10,000 bill. And he goes, oh, no, I won't. Just send it to me. We'll pay it. And I said. I just paid Joe 10 grand to come for a week, and you're just wiping all that away on and booze and fabric. And he goes, yeah, well, what? He goes, welcome to my life. That's what these guys are like. <laughs> they get bored on the road, and they try to find stupid things to do. And whether it's throwing TVs or shredding hotel rooms, that's kind of uh, you know, what happens to them. Um, it was about that time that I left radio. Um, I, uh, I, I went to uh, New York and I was the head of marketing at MTV Networks and we did a ton of research to try to find what it is that gets people excited, particularly adults excited, um, about watching music on TV. Uh, and we found the obvious, is that people like to get closer to their artists. They like to know more about them. They like to get behind the music. And when I was there, it was at a time when VH1 created shows like this that got you to know a little bit more about your favorite bands. You know, was, was the bass player, you know, the limo driver in that video? You know, that's what led to 
uh, a TV show called Pop-Up Videos that you might have heard of, Behind the Music. It was remarkable. Behind the Music tracked the rise and fall of artists' careers. Um, and they always had the same pattern. They start up here, the drummer dies, the lead singer has a heroin problem, something like that, and then all of a sudden they find their way back. Uh, and we were doing shows about you know, great superstar artists and, and artists like Donnie and Marie and, and Vanilla Ice and, and Millie Vanilli, just because they all made for such interesting television. But it made me realize that there is a hunger, that people of our generation love to get behind the music and like to know a little bit more about their favorite artists and, um, uh, and make emotional connection with the artists that you grew up with and loved. Uh, I had an opportunity, speaking of emotional connection, um, if you're familiar with the song uh, Tears in Heaven from Eric Clapton, and you probably know some of the story that it, it's about the uh, death of his four-year-old son, Connor. Uh, and I'll skip over most of it, but Connor ran out the 52nd floor window of a high-rise in Manhattan. Um, he was playing and went right over the railing. And Clapton walked into the hotel room and found out from his, the, 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 the boy's mother that his son had just fallen to his death. Uh, Clapton had spent the night before at the circus with his son, and it was the first time in his life, after years of drinking, after years of, of heroin, after years of womanizing, that he finally felt like a dad. And he w loved the night with his son at the circus, and he was looking forward to the next day he was going to take him to the zoo. That's why he was coming to get him, and he was devastated by that. And it led to the writing of the song, Tears in Heaven. And when Clapton decided to go out on tour, um, my radio station got together and I said, look, I said, this is a guy who's doing the hardest thing that a father can do. I mean, to write a song about the death of your son is hard enough, but to perform it every night in front of a live audience has to be just brutally difficult. So when he comes to town, let's not do a stupid contest where we're giving away tickets to the 10th caller or we're giving away an autographed guitar or the type of stuff that radio stations always do. I said, let's do something more meaningful. Let's honor the fact that he's one of the greats who just went through some horror, but he's here sharing it with us. What can we do? So I had the idea to call the BIC company. They make lighters and pens and all of that. And I said, I would like 20,000 BIC lighters. And what I'll do is put... Clapton's name on one side on the date of the show and our station on the other, and we will hand them out to people as they go into the concert that night. And we told listeners for the week leading up to the show, when you go to that show and you hear Clapton starting to play the opening notes of Tears in Heaven, go completely quiet. Don't make a sound and hold up your flame. And let him know that you appreciate him being there and that you respect the pain that he's had to go through. Make it not a sound. Um, and it was a difficult task to do, to get 16,000, 17,000 people to all do that. But at the night of the show, but we had people kind of stationed all around the venue, and they were handing out lighters to people as they were going in. Well, about halfway through the show, Clapton sets aside his electric guitar, picks up his acoustic, and there's a single light shining on a stool right over the center. And everybody in the venue knew what was coming next. So Clapton sits down, and he's playing the opening notes with his head down, like I am right now, playing the opening notes of Tears in Heaven, and it goes quiet. He's used to having people clap, and they go, oh, I recognize that song, and they cheer. Quiet. And he looks up, and he sees this sea of light, and he realizes exactly what's going on. And the people who were in the audience were moved by the fact that he stopped playing, and just for maybe 10 or 15 seconds, just looked out and marveled over the crowd, and you could tell that he was moved because when he started the song and started singing the song, his voice cracked. And he, he got all lost in the beginning of the song. And I told my staff afterwards that everybody who was in that venue that night and saw that, years from now, will hear Tears in Heaven come across the radio or at a party or a club. And they'll go, you know, I was there a night where I saw Eric Clapton do that. And here's the emotional connection that I have with that guy. I don't think that happens with Katy Perry. I don't think that happens with Taylor Swift. And I think Taylor Swift's phenomenal, by the way. I've, I've met her and I've, and I've seen her several times. Uh, tremendous talent. But I don't think that you're going to be seeing people wear, um, you know, Justin Bieber t-shirts 15 years from now. But they still wear this with pride. And I think that guys like Clapton who have that kind of emotional depth 
that make him special. It also speaks to the healing power of music, and that's kind of a recurring theme tonight, is that there is a redemptive power that energizes you and soothes you with music. But what's changed now? Why is it different now? And I think it's, it's changed on all kinds of levels, and it starts with the fans. You know, we come from a generation where we would listen to albums. Nobody puts out albums anymore. Nobody listens to albums anymore. We live in a singles world. We live in an iTunes world. People don't have the attention to sit through albums, you know, on the younger generation. And, you know, and, and how many years did we buy albums where you spend 10 bucks and find an album with two good songs? The record industry has changed, but I think that fans' attention span have changed. YouTube is now the new MTV. There's very little artist loyalty. If an artist like Coldplay is the biggest band in the land and they come out with a big record, they're done. I mean, they had their last record and U2's last record <laughs> disappeared, band is completely gone. There is no loyalty to bands anymore right now. Um, music has really become less genuine, I appeal, and more supported by effects. And, 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 and like I said, auto-tune and, and drum machines and the types of things that have changed fans. It's also become more of a social thing than a musical thing. I mean, if you go to the biggest thing in music right now is, is EDM. These, uh, these big dance festivals will draw 250,000 people and the DJ makes a you know, million dollars a night for pressing buttons. But Sorry, I showed my bias, but um, it's become more social. It's not about the music being brilliant. It was more of the party and the fact that it's a shared experience. The other thing that changes is record stores. Of course, they're gone. Music discovery is now done online. It's done with sharing with other people. Uh, music is now enjoyed largely on earbuds. You don't hear people, you know, go to the beach, you don't hear people listening to the radio or listening to a, to a CD anymore. It's very solo. Um, People are buying songs, not albums. I mean, for years, all of the artists that you hear me talk about tonight sold millions of records, millions, tens of millions of records. Last, this last year, Taylor Swift was the only artist to sell a million units. Um, it just speaks to the industry has changed where you can have a hit. There's also, you know, from the artist standpoint, um, I have to happen right now. It has to ignite immediately. I have to go on American Idol or The Voice, and I have to become famous tonight, and I have to make money immediately. And if you're familiar with the book by uh, Malcolm Gladwell called Outliers, he talks about having to invest 10,000 hours in anything if you want to be great at your craft. Uh, right now, there's really not a huge interest on most bands' part to make that investment. It's like, you know, we're pretty good. Maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe we know somebody. Maybe we can get famous. Um, but the, that, that whole dynamic from the band standpoint has changed. Um, concert promoters used to be based locally. I didn't grow up in D.C. I, I grew up in San Francisco. But there was also always concert promoters that we could call and say, look, there's a great band. I mean, I was very early on, on uh, Pat Benatar and Bon Jovi and, and um, uh, some bands like that, where I would call the promoter and go, boy, there's this great artist I heard. Can we bring him to town for a couple of bucks? And, Right now, the concert business has completely been commoditized and corporatized. It's owned by large companies like Live Nation that are big monolithic companies. Uh, they bring bands to town. They can charge 180 bucks a ticket uh, and put it out of range of most people uh, and charge 20 bucks for parking and 9 bucks for a Coke. Um, it's just a completely different world right now. It's about the bottom line profit. It's really not about the music anymore. Uh, record labels, who used to be so integral to the, to the launching of a band's career, are now largely irrelevant. There's, there's plenty of bands that break online that don't even need a record label anywhere. You'd be surprised the number of superstar artists that don't have a record label. Um, the record labels, rather than trying to embrace digital music and MP3s, they sued Nas Napster. They're trying to build walls in the ocean to protect people from... From, from going outside and buying digital songs, they still want you to buy a 12.99 CD with one good song on it. Uh, but they've completely uh, missed the, the digital revolution and are capping, uh, catching up right now, uh, still driving through the rear view mirror. And sadly, um, there hasn't been a great rock band uh, that has really happened in the last 10 years, 15 years. Uh, and if you think about it, even guys like Dave Grohl and Foo Fighters came from Nirvana. This is a sad one if we have any Bruce Springsteen fans in the house. If Bruce Springsteen were to come out today, he would never happen. Because his first two albums before Born to Run really went nowhere. And in the minds of a record label, if you don't happen right now, we're, you're done. You're off the label, we're dropping you, you have no chance. The, the uh, art of artist development and uh, A&R, artist and repertoire at the record labels, uh, 
had patience in developing artists and finding the talent that they could really nurture. Uh, they don't come any better in my mind than Bruce. He's still the best concert I ever saw and also the second best concert I ever saw. Uh, again, a guy who is passionate about his music, who lives for his music. It's what keeps him young and keeps him engaged uh, and also an extraordinary man. Um, what's interesting is that, I think this is the next slide. We grew up in an era of icons, people who were just bigger than life characters and personalities. The generation now, and I'm making a, you know, kind of a, a generalization, but they're a generation of shoegazers, of bands that stand there and just kind of play like this. Um, they're not bigger than life rock star personalities. Um, they, uh, they aren't really concerned with a legacy as much as hitting it, making some money, making enough money. Um, not a lot of investment in the craft, in singing and performing and playing and, and have something to say, and more importantly, how to earn it. Early on in, uh, in my career, I ran against, up against somebody that really did want to earn it. This is Sammy Hagar in 1980. This is a guy that works his ass off. He made friends at every radio station in America. He put out record after record after record. He played every crappy little club that you can imagine trying to just keep writing and pushing and touring and fighting and investing his 10,000 hours to become great. Um, I had a chance to get to know Sammy in the very beginning and we were backstage at a show with 1,500 people in the crowd in a five or 6,000 seat venue. And he was almost in tears with his head in his hands going, what does it take? How come I come out here and I'm touring like crazy and I can only fill up a quarter of the house? A couple of years later, Sammy looked more like that, and my hair grew out. Um, but if there's ever a guy that you want to see it happen for, Sammy's the guy. He, uh, he ended up um, selling, starting a uh, Cabo Wabo tequila company that he sold for 90-something million dollars, and is right up there in terms of one of the most uh, successful and wealthy rock stars of all time. This is about the same time with Sammy with uh, Van Halen. And they were kind enough to uh, dedicate it to, to the, me, the fifth Van Halen. Uh, I never saw their paycheck, though. <laughs> the last piece of this, and you've heard me talk a bit about it, and it's really sad for me, is the radio piece. Because music radio, in my opinion, is just a shell of what it used to be. And it's very sad for me to say I, I've had a chance to work in radio on the local level and the national level across the country. Uh, the spirit of innovation of radio is just sadly gone. The, the era of music discovery and having personalities that you can relate to is largely gone. It's been consolidated and turned into Mick Radio. And if you do any traveling around the country, you know that there's a station called Hot and a station called Magic and a station called Power and a sta you know, there's just the fan. They're, they're all over the country. They're cookie cutter replicas of each other. Rather than do something unique and individual, um, it's become more common for them to just be owned by one company that just makes a cookie cutter version. Uh, in this town, you have an extraordinary station like WTOP, but you also have several radio stations that are in town that you may not even realize. None of the disc jockeys live here. They don't, it, there are a couple of exceptions. Um, the music is all pre-programmed on a computer days in advance. So the idea of uh, taking a request or making sounding remotely spontaneous is completely false. Uh, everything lo is loaded into a hard drive. In fact, your favorite radio station is probably a hard drive. You would walk into the studio and there is absolutely nobody there or, or, or no live body. And, you know, as I say to people that, you know, if radio were a movie, they'd be rolling the credits now. It's, it's sad, unfortunately, but it's true. So what's the lesson here? The lesson to me is to stay forever young. Steve Jobs says that he likes to hire or liked to hire people that were infected. People who are infected with passion, people who couldn't wait to come to work and to be able to work on the next product. Um, these artists that I'm talking about and the ones that I wrote about in my book are people that were infected. They, they were passionate, they were totally engaged. They created music that spoke to your heart and your body and your mind. Uh, and they created an escape. They made an emotional connection. And I thought it was fitting to kind of wrap up this segment with a co another, another a genius message from, from Keith Richards who really says it correctly. 
You know, he's not here to make records. He's here to say something and to move other people. And and I think that that generation and that and the music of that generation just really was was built to do that. Now, if you're interested, I have a couple of other bonus stories that I will share with you. That's my message. <laughs> uh, my book, not to be a complete shill for my book, uh, my book is called I Killed Pink Floyd's Pig um, because I was told by my wife that sometimes the best book titles are the coolest chapter titles. So I quickly went to the table of contents and went all the way down and went, there you go. If I was, if I was looking for a book and I was at the airport at a bookstore, I'd say I, I'd pick up something that's called I Killed Pink Floyd's Pig. But Pink Floyd's Pig is a, uh, is a story, again, I was working at this radio station, and Pink Floyd was coming to play in the stadium, 60,000 seats, sold out, and I thought, what can I do to, to create some awareness for my radio station that Pink Floyd's coming to town? So I had the crazy idea to call Pink Floyd's manager and say, would you loan me your famous concert pig that I can fly over my radio station the week leading up to the concert? And his manager paused and goes, you must be out of your mind. We fly that in concert every night over the crowd. It hooks on a scaffolding rigging on a motorized thing, and it tracks around. And it's the high point of the show. The audience goes crazy. If anything were to happen to that pig, we'd be completely screwed. And I said, on my life, I will watch. I will sleep with this thing. Um, <laughs> nothing will happen to the pig. In a weak moment, they said yes. Um, and I thought, this is this is." Terrific. So this crate arrives and 300 pounds of pink fabric inside and we hoist it up on the roof and we inflate it with air and it's flying at about 80 feet above the radio station and it looks majestic. It was just wonderful. And all the TV cameras and the helicopters were flying around and people were pulling into our parking lot taking pictures of themselves with the pig in the background. It was really glorious. Um, this is a pig that has some experience in getting away. Um, it was created for the album cover Animals that Pink Floyd put out, and Roger Waters wanted the pig created so it can fly over the London Harbor. It's kind of a promotional stunt when the, when the album came out. But it broke through its tethers and flew 30,000 feet to the point where pilots were, re were reporting it. <laughs> and it shut down Heathrow Airport inbound and outbound until they could retrieve the pig. So as I'm flying the pig above the radio station, I'm thinking, boy, I really hope it stays here. Um, the morning of the concert, I had, I had sworn on my life that I would deliver the pig to the venue by 12 noon because they needed to inflate it and, and put guy lines on it and hoist it up and do test runs and all of that. So uh, the morning of the, uh, of the show, I get a call from my morning disc jockey at 6 a.m. and he goes, hey, look, I just pulled into the radio station and it's still dark outside, but I didn't see the pig. And I said, oh, it's gotta be there, it's 40 feet long. I said, look, it's a little lighter now, go outside and check again, so he puts the phone down, runs out, comes back, huffing and puffing, no, the pig's gone. So I'm looking at my clock, it's 6 a.m. I said, don't say anything to anybody, I'm on my way. So I jump in the car, fly to the radio station, park my car, scramble up this ladder to the top of the radio station, and lo and behold, the pig is deflated, and it's draped all over the air conditioning ducts and the gravel on top of the roof. It's gone. And I'm thinking, how does it deflate? What could happen to this thing? At least it didn't escape. But I'm now trying to, with a flashlight, because it's still dark, pick up corners of the pig and walk around it going, what's the problem? And I finally came right up by the chest of the pig, and I pick it up, and there's this giant L-shaped gash in the pig, three feet each direction. And laying right in the middle of the gash is a hunting arrow. Aww. Somebody, I think from a competing radio station, didn't like all the attention we were getting, and hired somebody, because this was a professional arrow, not that it was too hard to hit. <laughs> um, but it was done, and I'm thinking, okay, I've got to have this thing back at the venue at noon, it's now 7 a.m. and I've got a dead pig. Where do you even start repairing something like that? So I called kind of everybody in and said, okay, all hands on deck, what do we do? And we found a parachute company who said, sure, bring it in, we'll see what we can do. So we stuff 300 pounds of fabric into the radio station and van and fly all the way up 45 minutes to this parachute company. We bring it out and we spread this thing out all over his warehouse floor. And he says, well, I can't stitch it. 
He goes, you're going to inflate this thing. It won't hold. It'll pop. It won't hold the air. He goes, I have to put a patch on it. I said, great, whatever you need to do. And he starts going through his fabric, and he goes, well, this is about the closest I can get. And it was more orange than pink, but I didn't have a lot of options. I said, look, just do what you need to do. Just patch it up. So he goes, give me a, about an hour. And I said, I don't have an hour. And he goes, give me half an hour. So he's laying down and putting this patch on, and he's stitching up the pig, and it, it all kind of settles in. It looks like it's OK. And we stuff it in the van. And I'm looking at my watch, and it's 11 AM. And we have to be an hour away in the Seattle kingdom at noon. So we fly in there through wet streets and lots of traffic. And, and, I, and we get to the front of the venue. And here's this big, giant man standing right on the loading dock like this, looking at his watch. And we come in at 11.59. I said, got your pig. So we open the doors, and his road crew take it. And it's all kind of all crumpled in a ball. And we kind of threw it to them. And they ran with it inside. And we got the hell out of there. Um, and I never heard word one about what did you do to our pig. But I went to the concert that night. And when the time came for the pig to fly out, it flew. It, here it came right out on, to, on cue. And, and the crowd is just you know, going crazy. And, I'm, and all I can see is this orange L-shaped patch in the middle of it. But nobody seemed to m notice, or maybe they were too wasted to know. But, <clears throat> but the point is that I got away with it. I dodged the bullet. I it was responsible for killing Pig Florence Pig. And uh, we did some emergency surgery to actually save its life. But, um, but no, yeah, I never got in trouble over that. And now that I've titled the book that and Pink Floyd reads about it, I'm sure somebody's going to, you know, I thought something was funny <laughs> about, about the pig. Um, this is a story that actually better. And you can read about it on my website. The picture was too hot for my book. The publisher would not let me use it. But um, my radio station had a, a fun relationship with Van Halen from the very beginning. And we came, became good friends with the band and their record label and their management. And when they came to town, they always stopped by and visited. And, and, and we were, it was a party waiting to happen. There was one time when I heard that Van Halen was coming to town for two nights. And it was sold out. And I called their manager. And I said, hey, look, when the guys are in town, would they please come by the radio station? We'd love to vi visit and see what's going on and let them you know, play some records and talk on the air, something that rarely happens anymore. And, his manager goes, well, you know, they're really busy this time. I, you know, we love you guys, but we don't think it's going to happen. Fast forward a couple of months. It's about 2 in the afternoon, the day of the concert. Everybody's excited about the show. We're getting lots of requests at the station for playing Van Halen music. And the receptionist goes out over the all call and said, everybody look outside. And I look out the window, and I peel back my curtain, and here's motorcycle cops one after the other after the other stopping, followed by four limos, just bam, 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 bam. Out of the first one pops David Lee Roth with these two strippers. Right behind him was Eddie Van Halen, who I don't know, Eddie was running around with a penis-shaped squirt gun squirting people that was filled with beer. Um, so Eddie was probably running around doing that. Uh, and he pops out, and he's holding a case of champagne, and he has another stripper who's holding a cake big birthday cake for the radio station. Uh, and then Michael Anthony, the bass player, and Alex Van Halen, the drummer, are here. And they're also with strippers. And they have party poppers and streamers and all kinds of stuff that they brought in. They walk right into the radio station, walk right past the receptionist, down the hallway, open the control room, and said, we're here to take over. And they, <laughs> they took our disc jockey here in the middle and basically kicked him aside. And they went on the air and said what they wanted and played what they wanted. and. Um, they turned the studio monitors up, which you can't see in here, all the way to 10. And these girls got up, and they're dancing all over, you know, you know, clothes coming off. And it was just insane. And I'm, I'm pinned up against the back wall, standing next to Eddie Van Halen, going, what's going on here? What did I miss? And he goes, we wouldn't forget you guys. He goes, you didn't think we weren't going to come. And I said, yeah, but I didn't know you were going to come with all of this stuff. And there was just party poppers. And when the party was over, the, the entire control room was soaked with champagne because nobody bothered with glasses. Everybody had their own bottle, and they're dumping each over each other. It was, like, it was like a celebration after someone won the Super Bowl. And then on top of the soaked carpet was cake and party streamers and G-strings. And it was just this a mad mess. But they took over for two hours before they finally got called back by their manager to go back to uh, the venue because they had a concert to play last night. But, but um, the Van Halen stripper invasion is something that when I talk to disc jockeys nowadays and when I do radio interviews, 
the most common thing I'm asked once we stop the interview is, man, you know, your book really depressed me. <laughs> because nobody comes to our radio station now. I never get invited backstage. And if I do get invited backstage, they don't want to have anything to do with me after that. Because I feel like you were there when it was fun, and it's not fun now. Um, and, uh, and then it was kind of at that point that I realized maybe I should write these things down because um, the way that this book really happened was after being out with friends one too many times where they go, hey, you know, that's a funny story. You should write that down. And I started writing them down, and all of a sudden I had 35 that turned into a book. And, um, but this is chapter one, and it kind of sets the tone for, you know, hanging on for a wild ride because here we go. Um, this one is too embarrassing for me to tell you, but I did get a chance to actually spend some time with Robert Plant, the great Robert Plant, who was a magnificent man, uh, very smart, very articulate, very charming. He wanted to talk about his solo music because after he left Led Zeppelin, he wanted to know that people still liked him, that people could, could embrace Robert Plant without having Jimmy Page standing next to him. Uh, and he was all about um, trying to get some feedback on, you know, what did I think of his new record and did I think it was going to work? And here I am talking to the golden god of rock about do I think he has a prayer as a solo artist. Um, but I really wanted to impress him. I really wanted to say, I have a chance to really knock this guy out. He's, he's been interviewed by everybody. I'm going to just stun him with my brilliance. Uh, and I completely did a face flop. I embarrassed myself and, and the photographer at that very moment took, took this picture. So um, it takes a lot of courage to stand up here in front of you knowing that, that this was not my highlight uh, of my career when this happened. But um, I had a lot of fun. It was fun while it lasted. And it was a special window of time from the late 70s into the early 90s that um, really will never happen again. And if you were fans of that music, you really were truly into something special. So with that, I will say thank you for coming. Um, I have some books over here if you're interested. Uh, they're 15 bucks each, and I'll sign one for you. But before I do that, if, are there any questions? Uh, thank you for being here. It's been a wonderful uh, uh, opportunity to listen to your stories. Um, you've painted a pretty bleak picture about the future of radio and about the future of a lot of performers that you know, you're reflecting on. Uh, what we saw in the past and, and what we might see in the future. What, what's your sense as far as uh, what's the longevity for radio as we're used to knowing it? And, you know, what's the future for performers that we saw in the decades past? And I use this, or I, I pose this question with, with the reflection of having spent some time with my parents who are in their 80s who live in a small town in North Carolina, who have a great radio station that plays all of the stuff they like to listen to, uh, you know, Sinatra, all those folks that you right. mentioned earlier, which I guess is, what, 70, 80 years old. So I guess does any, d does any of this have any legs, and what's the future of radio? Thanks. Well, I actually hate to go down this road because so much of my life was spent at radio, and it was so good to me for so long. Uh, most recently, I was working in New York, and I was running one of the largest radio networks in America and had a lot to say with what was played on the radio stations. Okay. Uh, but I saw as, as companies became more dominant, you know, as they really bulldozed the landscape and didn't want to really take time to make an effort to be a local radio station, because it was so much cheaper to have one person just record tracks for 50 radio stations. I'll tell you something that you asked. Last company I was with, empl we employed a couple of hundred disc jockeys, and they would sit in the studio and say, hello, Birmingham, it's going to be 68 and clear today. Hello, Toledo, it's going to be 47 and clear, one after another. And these people would record 200 of those in one sitting. And it becomes robotic, and it became very much like a factory where there was really no passion, there was no soul, there was no engagement. It was just trying to work through that list. And that's sadly one of the patterns of radio. It's being commoditized. And I don't, I don't think that radio is standing up and fighting and saying, you know what, we can do things that Pandora can't. We can do things that Sirius XM can't. We can do things that you're not going to get from an internet radio station. But sadly, they're not inspired to do that, and their companies are more about cutting and cutting and cutting and, uh, rather than investing more about taking things away that might get you to tune out rather than adding things into their radio station that'll make it make you want to tune in. As for 
the audience you're talking about, radio is, is, makes its money on 25 to 54 year olds, period. That's what drives all ad agency business. Uh, it's the money demo, as they call it. So if you're playing music, and, and a lot of the 60s music that you're talking about, you're not gonna hear on the radio anymore for that reason. Because people who grew up with that music are gonna be 54 or 55 plus, and they can't sell it. So when you're talking about Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Al Martino and Perry Como and all of that, I'm surprised there's any of those stations left. So if your parents found one, God love them, tell them not to get too attached. It's not gonna be there for long. Hi, thank you for being here. It's been uh, wonderful to listen to you. Coincidentally, I just uh, read a biography of David Bowie. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the author's name, but I, I got it here at the library. And it started when he was just I think 14 or so, and really back in the early 60s, maybe even late 50s, and runs through the whole gamut of everything, the details of his whole life and how he dealt with the business, the business of music, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very inter interesting to watch the, de the development as you've expressed it here. But I'm just curious if you'd ever met him. Uh, I did. I, I met him actually during his heyday. Um, he uh, he re during the era of Let's Dance, which was kind of, at least commercially, his peak. And and his, he had two guitar players that he worked with. Peter Frampton and Stevie Ray Vaughan were the guitar players that played with David Bowie. David Bowie also ha has the distinction of being the only guy I know who sold stock in himself. Yeah. You could buy stock in how well he does from here forward. Unfortunately, his greater, greater days were kind of behind him. Um, I, didn't, I did meet David Bowie, very classy, very elegant man, very soft-spoken man, uh, also shorter than me. Most of the stars, it's interesting, you know, I'm 5'10 on a good day. Uh, but when you start meeting some of these artists, it's really remarkable how taller than most of them. It's really remarkable. Um, I also got to, there's several stories in my book about the band ACDC. We're like, I don't think any of them are five, six. They're all just a bunch of little guys and they get out on stage and it's just big monster sound. But um, I, I, I met Bowie once backstage. It was very kind of a quick, you know, nice to meet you and two minute discussion, but very classy band. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Uh, interesting stories. Uh, I was on the radio back in the late 70s myself station in Erie, Pennsylvania. We had a Drake Chenault format, these uh, yeah. you know, nascent formats that slowly stamped themselves all over the country. Anyway, uh, in, uh, and I don't want to get too downer here, but on a December day in 1980, I was watching Monday Night Football when Howard Cosell announces that John Lennon is dead. That's how I got that experience. How did, what happened with you and what was the what surrounded that on the radio where you were? Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, I never got to meet John. Um, you know, when people ask me, I mean, who haven't you met that you would like to, he'd probably be right, right there as number one. Um, I was running a radio station in 1980. We were, it was in our heyday. Um, and I came out of a restaurant, and I got in the car, and I, and I turned on my radio station, and my disc jockey, who's also one of my best friends, was on the air, and he's crying. And I'm thinking, what is going on? I mean, this is a rock station at night. It should be, you know, it's crying. And there's a listener saying, Steve, it's going to be okay. It's going to be, you'll be all right. And Steve goes, I know, but I just can't believe John Lennon's dead. And that was the first that I heard. And I remember running right through a red light in a big, busy intersection, like three lanes each direction. I went right through the middle of it. Uh, and then I drove to the radio station and, and heard the news and stayed there most of the night as all the reports were coming in and the vigils were popping up around the country. But... Horrible night. Have you been to Strawberry Field in Central Park? Yeah. yeah. Got to pay homage right across from the Dakota. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, 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 I lived in, in the New York area for the last 17, 18 years before moving here uh, and took my kids to the Dakota. And uh, I asked the guard there. I said, people still come by here a lot? He said, every hour of every day, rain or shine, warm or cold, all the time. And even while I was there, cabs slow and people get out. And again, I don't think that they're going to do that. God forbid that you know one of the pop stars of today, you know, meets their fate like that. But I just don't think that the lasting, you know, uh, you know, 35 years later, that that'll be the same. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate you coming out. I hope it was uh, worth the price of admission. <laughs> and uh, if you're interested, I'll step over here and uh, and sign some books for you if you'd like.